Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm going to teach you how to create and destroy objects inside of Unity. Now, there are a few different ways to do this, but I cover all of them in this video, so you'll learn about all of them. Before we begin, though, I'm going to teach you about one more thing just so you get a better understanding of how instantiate and destroy work inside of Unity. That being the C-sharp class object. To take a look at this lovely little diagram that I've made here. You can see that most things in Unity will always be derived from the object class in one way or another, whether that's through another script or just being derived from the object class itself. So, for example, all of the scripts that you're going to make inside of Unity are going to derive from mono behavior. Then, mono behavior derives from behavior. behavior derives from component and then component finally derives from object so it always comes back around now why is this important, you might ask? It's important because both the instantiate and destroy functions inside of Unity take in that object class, object type, as their first parameter. So for example, that's why you can pass in game object, rigid body, any of the components you make, colliders, you can pass all of that into either of those functions because they inherit from object eventually. And that's the beauty of inheritance, baby. It's so simple, it works great. So that's the first little bit I wanted to teach you, but now we can actually get on to learning how to use both instantiate and destroy and their alternatives. In my example, I've got a pretty basic Unity project. All I have is a player controller that moves around from my last Tutorial. But for this video, I'm gonna make a separate script that'll basically call for player input and when they press that button It'll do whatever I want it to which in this case is showing you the different ways of creating and destroying objects So looking at my script, it's actually pretty basic I just have an if statement basically asking did the player press the left mouse button and if they did do whatever's inside this if statement So the first way I'm gonna show you how to create objects is using instantiate now Instantiate is probably gonna be the one you're gonna use nine times out of ten That's not very often to use the other ones that I show in this video So I'm gonna show you the most common one first that you're gonna use pretty much for everything as you can see per the unity documentation all instantiate does is clones the original object and then returns that clone. As you can see here shown in this list, there are a few different ways you can use instantiate, all these different overrides. And of course, your use case will be different depending on what you're doing. So go ahead and read up on all of these just to figure out what they do. And maybe it's the one you need. I don't know. The biggest takeaway from this page is you can see that instantiate clones the object class we were talking about earlier, which means you can pass just about anything into this function as long as it derives from that object class. The main thing you use instantiate for is creating clones of a prefab or a game object in the scene. So with that being said, I'm going to show you how to use instantiate in its most basic form here in a second. I'm gonna make a public game object variable here that'll store the game object that I want instantiate to clone. And the first version or override I'm gonna show you of instantiate is just the one that asks for an object. No position, no rotation, no parent, nothing like that, just the object itself. So in this first example here, I'm just telling instantiate to duplicate whatever that prefab variable is that I assign in the inspector. So while I'm putting together my little prefab here, I'm gonna teach you one more thing about instantiate. If you decide to use the instantiate override that does not ask for a position or a rotation, it'll duplicate that object with a position and rotation that it already has. So in this example, I'm giving my prefab a custom position, not rotation, because I forgot to do that. But the key is that I'm not making the position 0, 0, and you'll see why here in a second. So I created my prefab, and then I assigned it to that prefab variable in the inspector. Now you can see when I hit play and I hit the left mouse button, it instantiates that game object. Any object that gets created with instantiate will always have clone in parentheses appended to the end of it. Just to let you know, like, hey, I'm not the original one, I'm a clone, I'm a duplicate, I'm not real. But as you can see, because I gave that prefab a custom position, it created it with that custom position. Personally, I've never found this useful. I don't think I've ever used this inside of one of my games before. But you can see how it could be useful. And I wanted to share it with you anyways because it's just a little, kind of like a little little Easter egg. You know, they've hidden inside Instantiate. And again, I forgot to do it in this example, but this also works with rotation. And since these are all getting created at the exact same position, they're all stacking on top of one another. We'll fix that here in a second. So moving on here, the next override I'm going to talk about is the one that asks for an object, a position, and a rotation. In this example, I just put in transform.position for that position variable, which is just where my player's at because I have the script attached to my player. And for the rotation, I'm going to put random.rotation. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it's just a random rotation provided by the random class inside of Unity. But for both of these, you can put whatever position and whatever rotation you want. These are the ones I'm just using in this example. So now back inside of Unity, when I hit play, you can see when I click the left mouse button, not only is it creating it at the position that my player is, but it's also randomizing the rotation. Also, don't worry about the player like teleporting all over the place. That's just what happens when two colliders get intersected at the like the exact same frame that kind of split apart. So I mentioned this earlier, but if you take a look at the little tooltip for instantiate, you can see that it takes in that object class as a parameter, or more specifically, a reference to some sort of object class. And if you also remember, things like game object, rigid body, any of the scripts you make, colliders, literally any of the components inside of Unity all derive from mono behavior, which derives from behavior, then derives from component, then derives from object. So what you can do is instead of passing in, say, a game object to instantiate, you can pass in a component like a rigid body or a collider or anything like that. Now, if we take a look back at the Unity docs, you can see that if you instantiate a component, it'll duplicate the object that it's on. But you're probably asking, why the hell would I do this instead of just instantiating a game object when, you know, it instantiates a game object anyways. And that brings me to the next little piece I'm going to talk about, which is called casting. Now, I can't 
can't really think of a good analogy for casting, but I'm going to try to explain it in the best and most simple way that I can. So once again, if you take a look at the Unity docs, you can see that Instantiate itself returns an object, and in turn also takes in an object to clone. But let's say if you instantiate like a game object or a rigid body, like we're doing this example, they're not technically objects, they just derive or inherit from object itself. And after putting your type into that instantiate function, you can actually hover over it and see the little tooltip, and you'll see inside of these arrow brackets what it's actually casting to. So now, instead of returning an object, it's returning a rigid body, or a game object, or a transform. Basically, whatever type the object parameter is. I would recommend going and watching a different casting tutorial on YouTube, because I think it'd be beneficial, just to get a better understanding of how it works, because my explanation is definitely not the best. So, branching off from casting, the next thing I'm going to show you is how to store whatever object that instantiate created into a local variable. So you can use it later on, reference it, change values on it, put it into another variable, do whatever you need with it. First thing to note here is I changed the rigid body prefab to a game object prefab again, but you don't have to do this. It can be any type as long as it derives from object. I'm just using game object in my example. Returning to the instantiate line, what you can actually do is create a local variable and assign it to be that instantiate function, which if you look at the Unity docs, you can see that instantiate actually returns the object that it clones. And again, you can change game object here to be any type that you want. The only thing that matters is that both variables have the same type. So in this example, my prefab variable is a game object and the local variable I'm creating is a game object. But they could both be rigid body, colliders, audio sources, your custom scripts, anything like that. They just have to be the same type. But again, you might be asking yourself, why the hell would I want to do this? Why not just run instantiate without storing it in a local variable? Now, I think more often than not, you're probably going to be storing whatever you instantiate in a local variable like this anyways. But you want to do this in instances where you need to change something on the object after you've created it. So in this case, I'm changing game object dot name, which is just the name of the object. But this can be anything. You can change the scale, position, or rotation of a transform. You can change all the different variables and options of a rigid body or turn a collider on or off or anything like that. And now back in Unity, if I hit left click, you can see not only instantiates that game object, but it also changes the name to object. So it's no longer prefab clone. It's just object because that's what I'm setting it to. Inside of Unity, you can create empty game objects. The two ways you can do this is either by going to the create tab at the top of Unity and then click new empty game object or doing the exact same thing in the hierarchy. What if I told you there's another way you can do it, a third way? And this is, of course, by doing it inside of one of your scripts. And all you have to do is type new game object. That's it. And literally all this does is just creates an empty game object. That is it. There are a few different overrides for this that you can use. The first one having no parameters at all, it just creates an empty game object. The second override being you can give it a name and it'll create that empty game object with that name. And the third override being you give it a name and then you give it components to add to that empty game object. Utilizing the override with no parameters at all, you can see it just creates new empty game objects. So I could show you that second override where it's just the name, but I think that's pretty boring and I think it makes sense. So instead I'm gonna show you the third override where again, you give it a name and then you tell it what components to add to that empty game object. So the first parameter name is pretty obvious. It's just a string, but the way you're going to tell it to add different components is by using this type of right here. Type of is pretty simple. All it does is return the type of whatever you pass into it. So in this example, I'm just telling it to add a rigid body and a box collider. Back inside of Unity, you can see the empty game objects that it's creating are not only named now, but they also have both those components attached to them. Now they're invisible. We'll fix that here in a second. But all that matters is that you can see it's working. So inside of that override where we're telling it to add these components, I'm going to tell it to also add a mesh render and a mesh filter. Then I'm going to store that empty game object that I just created as a local variable like we did earlier with instantiate. Before we go any further, I'm going to create two variables up here. One that's a reference to a mesh and one that's a reference to a material. Next, I'm going to get that mesh filter component on that new created object and basically to set the mesh to be that variable we created. Back in Unity, if you click that little circle next to the mesh variable we just created, you'll get a whole list of all of the meshes in your project. This is a pretty blank project, so the only ones listed here are just the default ones that come with every project. So in this case, cube, capsule, sphere, quad, plane, you know, all those. I decided to choose cube here, but it doesn't matter which one you pick. You can pick any mesh at all. And now if you hit play and hit left mouse button, you can see not not only are we creating those empty game objects, we're naming them, we're attaching all those components, and then we're basically telling the mesh filter, here's the mesh that you're gonna use. And right now they're pink, but that's because they have no material. We're gonna fix that really quick. Back in the script, all you have to do is get that mesh render component and then assign the material to be that variable we created. Back in Unity, I made the material green material, but you can make it whatever you want. Now when you hit play and you hit left mouse button, you can see it basically just creates a cube. Although this example is overkill, you can see how this could be useful because you can basically make any sort of game object at runtime. It doesn't necessarily have to be prefab as long as you know what you want on it. Now, I don't find myself using this method nearly as much as instantiate, but it is useful sometimes. And the last and final creation method we're gonna talk about is gameObject.create primitive. GameObject.create primitive has absolutely no overrides at all. All it asks for is this primitive type variable. And you can see all the different things you can make with this primitive type. For the most part, this is just like creating a cube or a sphere or a capsule inside of your scene with the create menu. Once again here, just like with instantiate and new game object, I'm creating a local variable here that's basically just going to store whatever create primitive creates. And then I'm just setting the position to be the player's position just so we can kind of see how this is working a little better. Create primitive is not that useful, but I'm sure there are use cases for it. I think I've used it like twice in my entire game making career. So do with it what you will. So last up here, I'm going to show you how to destroy objects inside of Unity. Now being totally honest, 
this, there are basically only two ways you can destroy objects inside of Unity. The first one being destroy, and the second one being destroy immediate. Nine times out of ten, you're only ever going to use destroy. However, there are cases where you need to use destroy immediate. Let's take a look at the Unity docs for both destroy and destroy immediate. As you can see here, destroy will destroy the object at the end of the current update cycle. However, it is in the same frame. It's not next frame. It's just delayed. Whereas destroy immediate will destroy it immediately, like the name implies. You're probably thinking to yourself, what the hell is the difference between destroy and destroy immediate? The only time you're going to want to use destroy immediate is if you're making some sort of custom editor script. So if you aren't making a custom editor script or you don't know what that is, just use destroy. There are two different ways you can use the destroy function. The first one being just passing in the object you want to destroy and leaving that delay variable at zero or passing in the object you want to destroy and then specifying how long you want the delay to be. We'll cover both here, but it's pretty self-explanatory. So I went ahead and made a public game object variable here. And I'm just going to assign it to be a random object in my scene. And this is basically just telling the computer what I want to destroy. I decided to assign it to this giant green target ball that I have in my scene. Now, if you enter play mode and then hit the left mouse button, you can see it disappears. It gets destroyed. It's gone. So now I'm going to show you how to use destroy with a delay. You're going to do the same thing, except for that delay variable, you're going to pass in any number you want. I'm using two seconds, but you can make it one second, half a second, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever you want it to be. Back in Unity, if I hit play and then I hit the left mouse button, you'll see that after two seconds, it gets destroyed. You'll probably use this delay variable a lot. It's actually pretty handy. Another thing with destroy and destroy immediate is that object parameter is of the type object, which if you remember, just like instantiate means we can pass in anything that derives from object. So I'll give you an example. If you pass in a game object, to destroy, it'll destroy that entire game object. However, you could pass in a rigid body or a script or a collider, an audio source, any sort of component. And instead of destroying that entire game object, it'll instead just destroy the component. So think of destroy like the complete opposite of instantiate, even down to the type that it asks for. And in my example, I'm using a game object, but you can use any type that you want. So I think that's it. In one of the next tutorials that I make, we're gonna go over something called object pooling, which is basically a more efficient way of creating objects. But for now, don't worry about that. Just use instantiate like I showed you here. And the same goes for destroy, just use destroy. With that being said, I'll see you next time.